I kid you not, Dave, in the olden days, wizards used to measure their power via their balls. Wow, really, Ted? They would just, on a count of three, reach into their ro robes, whip out the balls, and that's how they decided who the best, most powerful wizard was? The time Igwil whipped out her balls, the other wizards were just blown away. Yeah, those Mage Fair fireball competitions, man, they were no joke. Even Illminster was impressed when Igwil started whipping out her great balls of fire. Welcome to Nerdarchy. For nerds, by nerds, I'm Nerdarchist Dave, and today I'm hanging out with this guy. Nerdarchist Ted. Hey folks, do you want D&D content you can drop right into your game? If the answer is yes, then don't forget to crit hit that subscribe button and to tune to that notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Right, so today we're talking about go-to spells for your wizard, tier one, so first level through third level. There's a bunch of great spells and we've got it kind of broken down into different categories. If you guys watched the intro and you kind of thought that was amusing, uh, it was kind of brought on by... Uh, you know, something that was in a short story called, you know, Ma uh, Elminster at the Mage Fair. And it was a, a cool story about mages at these mage fairs would throw out fireballs to see whose was the, the biggest, whose who had the most power. And it was kind of amusing. It's like, oh, well, you know, this is a, apparently a thing because back in the old days, your fireball didn't matter you didn't cast spells using higher level spell slots. As you got more powerful, your fireballs were bigger. Yeah, 5e is a lot different than previous editions of the game where everything just, you know, scaled with level. Don't have that anymore. So, you know, so, so it kind of made sense for, you know, for that story back in the day. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some go-to spells and we're going to break them down to attack spells, buff spells, defense spells... We're going to look at utility. We're going to look at something that's, you know, what we feel is an overlooked. And then we're going to throw in the bonus iconic spell. Absolutely. So there's five different ones. Uh, we decided we wanted to have a little bit of fun with this. Uh, for this, we're going to, you know, read the descriptions of the spells and talk about the spells. And we have our handy dandy devices so we can just look them up on D&D Beyond. I mean, since we're mentioning D&D Beyond, we might as well mention that they're the sponsor for this video. They make this stuff so much easier. We're able to put in different tags, different search criteria, and just have what we need at our fingertips. But not only that, we can also make characters over there, design monsters, as well as use it as a campaign journal. And beyond that, you've got all of the great free content between articles and videos that are posted regularly. So we're going to start off with our go-to attack spell, uh, which could almost be an iconic spell as well. <laughs> all right. And, and for this one, we're going to look at Magic Missile. And, you know, Magic Missile is a, a staple in D&D. &D. Uh, and, you know, we feel it's kind of the best attack spell for that first tier. Because it does force damage, which so things are resistant, very few things wind up being resistant or immune to, and it's an auto hit. You know, now, yeah, with an auto hit, that means there's no saving throw, no attack roll, no crit, but if you need to, to, to get damage dished out, nothing's going to do it better like Magic Missile. Yeah, Magic Missile gives you the ability to hit multiple targets, decide how you want to do it. It's a scalable spell, meaning you can pump it up and put more spots in, slots into it and do more damage. I played higher level wizards and, you know, I had monsters that were just resistant to different energy types. They were making their saving throws. They were hard to hit. And I was like, you know what? That's it. I am going to action surge and double dose magic missile at a higher level spell slot. Uh, just because it just guaranteed being more effective. You know, and that, that's, uh, you know, a great thing. Uh, you know, it does not scale in comparison to the amount of, of damage it does to other spells. But as you said, the guaranteed damage made it worth it. Absolutely. So uh, next we're going to go to our buff spells, right? And in my opinion, one of the best buff spells in the game at any level is haste. Haste is a, a great spell from a multitude of avenues. You know, it's going to give you more options to do in combat. It's going to give you that improved AC. It's just a great spell all around. Yeah, I mean, so Haste, choose a willing creature that you can see within range. 30 feet, not bad. Until the spell, a spell ends, the target's speed is doubled. It gains a plus two bonus to AC, has advantage on dexterity saving throws, and gains an additional action on each of its turns. That action can be used only to take the attack, one weapon attack only, 
dash, disengage, hide, and use an object action. Now these are all really great. And it's even better if you don't use it on yourself as the mage for the most part, unless you're a Gish type character, but use it instead on that barbarian or that paladin or that fighter, those folks that are up front taking punishment from the enemies and also dishing out damage. It's just a phenomenal spell. So we definitely had to put it in there for the, the best buff spell. So next we are going to jump to our defense spell. And for that, we went with uh, tried and true. I think shield hands down is one of the best defensive spells in the game. The ability to just uh, allow you to improve your armor class as a reaction, there are many times that it's like, all right, well, the DM gives you, you know, oh, I, I hit AC 17. Well, my AC is 14, but I can bump it up by five. Nope, that misses. The way it works, boom, you've got the ability to just deny damage. Is going to last until your next turn. Uh, so that that's a plus, and it makes you immune to magic missile, and it makes you immune to magic missile, which is one of the one of the few ways you can actually dodge being hit ma with magic missile. There are not many ways, and that's one of them. And it's a reaction to use, which means you're you're not eating up your combat round with a defensive spell. You're just bloop. Yeah, and not only that, wizards generally do not have a lot of reactions that they can use, so this one just makes a lot of sense. For our next category, we've got Overlooked. And, you know, looking through D&D Beyond, you know, we wind up finding that, you know, there are a number of spells that are not in a player's handbook that, you know, not everybody is going to have access to. And because of D&D Beyond and sorting things by level, it's like, oh, here's a hidden gem that does a decent amount of damage. From the Elemental Evil Player's Companion, there's a, there's a spell that I overlooked before, and it's called Ice Knife. Uh, you create a shard of ice and fling it at one creature within range. You make a ranged spell attack against the target. On a hit, the target takes 1d10 piercing damage. Okay, you know, that's not as good as a firebolt cantrip. Regardless of hit or miss, the, tar the target and each creature within 5 feet of it must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or take 2d6 cold damage. So cold damage doesn't have as much uh, resistances as fire. So if everything goes your way, you've got the ability to dish out between 3 to 22 points of damage. That is certainly a higher scale than Magic Missile. And that's that 2d6 damage has that hitting an area. So, yeah. And it's also another spell that you can pump up so you can do more damage if you need to. And if something happens to be vulnerable to cold or has a bad deck save, maybe this is something you would want to use. For me, I went with Catapult, and I actually got inspired with this spell while watching a Taking 20 video where Cody was talking about Overlook spells. Um, in and of itself, it's not bad. A small object weighing one to three pounds, you can take it and fling it as long as it's within 90 feet of you. You get a decent range on that spell. Any object within 60 feet of you can then fling it 90 feet. Uh, and it does 3 to 8 bludgeoning damage. It's also scalable. You can, you can increase the damage by pumping it up. But when I was watching Cody's video, it really got me thinking about an alchemist character that used alchemy supplies, right? Uh, acid and, and alchemist fire, both of them, when they hit something, they break and they do their damage. Well, it, 3 to 8 points of bludgeoning damage to the object you use and the person being hit... To me, that's going to be an auto break, and they're going to also take the take the alchemist fire damage or the acid damage. Obviously, you're, you would want to check with your DM and see how they're going to rule on this. But personally, as a DM, I would have to say that the these effects would stack, and they would take both damages. Now, you know, when you look at these kind of things, clearly you are using your spell slot and you are using the consumable object. So for me, I would totally allow it. Other GMs are going to make their determination. And let's face it, as a GM, if that player is like, oh, well, I'm an alchemi alchemical you know, person, I've always got all these things on me, that means you know, they're susceptible to you know, having those things on them and whatever mishaps can occur. There's problems with it for sure. <laughs> but it's an interesting way to do it. It's a little bit different. So that was my Overlook spell. So next we're going to go on to Utility. And where are we looking at there, Dave? All right, Utility. Uh, in the game that I've run, uh, in the game I've played in with Ted, almost 
every caster takes this, especially if they're a ritual caster. And that is Lehman's Tiny Hut as a utility spell. It's basically saying, you know what? I'm going to rest for my eight hours, my long rest, and never have to worry about having that rest disrupt it. You're safe. You're protected. You can, it lets a bunch of people in. It, it lasts the eight hours that you need. It's a ritual spell. You don't even have to use a spell slot if you're a ritual caster. So basically, the spell reads, a 10-foot radius, a mobile dome of force springs into existence around and above you and remains stationary for the duration. The spell ends if you leave the air, its area. Nine creatures of medium size or smaller can fit inside the dome with you. The spell fails if the area includes a large creature or more than nine creatures. Creatures and objects within the dome when you cast the spell can move through it freely. All other creatures and objects are barred from passing through it. Spells and other magical effects can't extend through the dome or be cast through it. The atmosphere inside the space is comfortable and dry regardless of the weather outside. So this is an amazing spell, utility spell, that may not even really cost you resources to use. All right, so this has been used in a, in a lot of different games, and when you've got a, a caster who has made it to 5th level, they've got access to 3rd level spells, they're a ritual caster, and boom, they get this one. Forget, you know, random encounters in the middle of the night. Forget worrying about sleeping in the cold, or sleeping in the heat, or sleeping in the wet. You are comfortable, you are dry, you're golden. Say goodbye to those levels of exhaustion. Say goodbye to you know not being able to sleep through the night the wizards got this covered in theory doesn't this sound like you could probably ca even cast it underwater in theory <laughs> it does say it's dry now mind you you do have to have the ability to you know verbal cast you know under underwater so you've got to be able to you know be breathing water for it to happen but, you know, it would be a nice uh, respite as long as, you know, one of the players can breathe underwater. Uh, well, the caster can breathe underwater to get this off. Um, I think Jeremy Crawford rules if you cast a spell by holding your breath, then you lose your breath. The, the cast time on this is one minute. So even longer if you're going to ritually cast it. So that would be a bit of a problem. <laughs> you would drown before you got it off. But if you had the way to water breathe while you cast it you could in theory cast it underwater and that would kind of like extend your resources if you're in a underwater adventure absolutely all right so our last go-to spell is going to be our bonus iconic spell and i'm guessing that if you watch the intro you kind of know where we're going with this one fireball is such the iconic spell I don't know a, you know, well, I can't say I don't know any wizards who didn't take it because it does happen. But for the most part, every wizard that, you know, you come across like, oh, yeah, fireballs, it's on my list. Well, when the designers talk about game balance, they often talk about the spell fireball because they said, no, some things in the game are just meant to be better. And fireball statistically is better than the other spells. Uh, if you could read that for us, Ted. All right. So a bright streak flashes from your pointing finger to a point you choose within range and then blossoms with a low roar into an explosion of flame. Each creature in the 20 foot radius sphere centered on that point must make a dexterity saving throw. The target takes eight die six fire damage on a failed save. Half as much on a successful. The fire spreads around corners. It ignites flammable objects in that area that aren't being worn or carried. You can, of course, spend a higher level spell slot to add an additional die six. It's casting time. It's instantaneous. Range is 150 foot away. You know, obviously, it's got the, the verbal, somatic, and material component, which is a tiny ball of bat guano and sulfur. As it always has been. <laughs> so, yeah, so the fireball is an iconic spell. Granite fire is one of the most resistant damage types in the game. But that being said, you know, when you combine the amount of damage you're doing and the range of the spell and just like, I don't know a wizard that doesn't live to get the fifth level so they can cast those third level spells so they can drop that fireball. It's been a thing since for as long as I've been playing in the game. Yeah, L Lightning Bolt is, is nice. It does the same amount of damage, but it does a line. And very rarely does the line allow you to get as many targets as that fireball and you know pulling out a fireball template and putting it on the on a battle map is like wow i'm gonna be able to hit all of these things with eight die six points of fire damage it's crazy and as we kind of stated in the beginning fireballs are just impressive <laughs> so the question is if you like this content if you want to see even more content like this we we have a place where one 
you can get that. But we also want to thank those people that are already hanging out with us over there, and that is Patreon. The Nerdarchy Patreon is a great way to support us. It allows us to do these videos. We're creating content out there. Matter of fact, I just sent some out the other night that you guys are going to be able to drop right into your game. Oftentimes, it's stuff we talk about on these videos, and we put it into a PDF. And eventually, it'll go to our store. But over on Patreon, you get it first, and you get it for less. There's a bunch of other benefits as well. So another way, great way to support our channel is to check out our sponsors, like the link in the description below for D&D Beyond. Help out the channel by supporting the sponsors. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.